AI cannot wipe out creative endeavor because people ultimately connect with other people. Foolishly, the creators of the show they all thought the gladiators weren't important. Ratings tanked. If it was the best possible experience, the thinnest subset of people would actually want to do it. They want the sanitized, low-level, fun version. Everything is a story, but how real do they want that story to be? People will pay millions of dollars for the most ridiculous fart on a piece of canvas if it was farted by Picasso. AI cannot eliminate that. It's wrong to say only the content matters. People don't only value content on the face value of the content. The very first thing that your mind buys into is somebody and their story. Hey, welcome to The Create Unknown, the home of Make Something Mean Something, and a proud supporter of child labor. <laughs> <laughs> ben, uh, I'm, right. I'm Kevin Lieber. With me, as always, is Matthew Tabor. And uh, we've been retweeting a lot of this great news coming out about putting kids back to work in, in factories. Hopefully, the mines are on their way. They're next. I'm not really sure. But we're, we're keeping tabs on this development in the United States here. Yeah, and I think I, I, think I regret not, not creating an army of child laborers. I mean, it's I, I could always start now. Mm -hmm. I, I could... You know, I, I really could put uh, a, an umbrella academy kind of thing together worldwide if I if I wanted to. I could just use points to to begin this. But you know, how many years until they're actually capable of you know using a chainsaw, for example? Mm -hmm. Probably six years. You know, you could give a five year old uh, an electric chainsaw with like an eight inch bar, and it would be safe. That would be fine. Uh, but I mean, I don't have five or six years. Like I need work done now. And I don't have I don't have the 12 to 15 children I need mm -hmm. to do it all. Yeah. So I this is a massive, massive regret that I've wasted my life on YouTube and news and just all of this stuff that uh that isn't dealing with mowing lawns or cutting brush or or anything actually useful in the world. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Well, maybe that'll be, you know, your next business endeavor, which is creating some sort of rent a child laborer, uh, you know, kind of like Uber or yes. Uber Eats or uh, one of those sort of, what, what are those things called? Sharing economy? <laughs> like a ch yeah. child sharing economy? Okay. This will obviously yeah, the, uh go can will will and can go poorly very quickly and i'm <laughs> saying this in jest but uh <laughs> for people who are taking it say, literally how many uh how many how many fbi <laughs> tags are we going to get yeah. on this where it's like right. oh you can rent a child wink yeah, i know oh good good idea kevin i know no but if anybody what we do is we we come up with an internship program for the create unknown for uh uh young young creatives ages 5 to 14 and it's just it's just a labor camp. It, it really is. But, but we'll house them well and feed them well and like perfect nutrition. We'll treat them very nicely. But we would expect 12 hours a day of, of actual labor. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's that's a good internship program to me. It is. It is. And it'll be mostly involving, you know, moving rocks. But that's an important skill, you know, in order to attain Younger, the better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Enough of this. We, and, uh, yeah, please, you know. Conrad suggested we host out of a pizza place. And I, I do have the name now. We can call it Vsauce 2 Anon. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely time to move on. Okay, I have, I have, yep. a, I have yep. a thing that popped recently. So let me start off by saying that a year ago, we had Psychic Pebbles on the podcast, and we spent a lot of time talking about AI and AI wiping out creative jobs. Uh, he was extremely prescient on this topic. And ho yeah. hopefully when we have him back on the show, I think sooner than later, we can revisit it with him. However, so at that time, I don't. I think that I had um, an intuition about my feelings on this topic, but I didn't have it really front of mind 
and least of all, like not, uh, uh, you know, sort of coordinated in a way that I could articulate it to somebody else. However, okay. that has changed. That has changed. You had a breakthrough. I had a breakthrough thanks entirely to the American Gladiators. Of, Which one? Of all things. No, just just the show in general. All of them? Yeah, no, no, no. So uh, what happened is they uh, they made this documentary on Netflix called Muscles and Mayhem, the unauthorized story of American Gladiators. And I watched this yesterday. It's a five-part like mini mini series. Oh, it's that long. I thought it was like a 90-minute thing. No, 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 no. It's multiple episodes, five episodes. They're all around 40-ish minutes long. And they go through, you know, the start up to the end of American Gladiators, which was huge when we were kids. Do do we need to provide context for what this show is? Yes. Because I'm trying to remember if they rebooted it and if it's if it's something that like people in in our child labor camp would know about. <laughs> no, no, no. The rock movers will have no idea, I don't think, what American Gladiators is. So I'll start by just saying that it was, um, a, a, there are sort of modern versions of it, like um, Great American Ninja, I think is a show. And basically it's like a, uh -huh. a physical fitness activity game show style that uh, launched in 1989 and ran until 1996, I think, 95 or 96. Oh, wow. It was seven seasons before they, they shut it down. The, uh, the, general, the general premise is that you have these gladiators. These, they, were, they were bodybuilders. They were at the beginning. They were huge. All of them were huge. Well, and this was really like sort of at the fulcrum of like steroid, He-Man, mm. Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger, like giant muscle people was such a thing by like the late 80s. That American yeah. Gladiators was riding that wave and said, like, how do we get a show where there are giant muscle people who look like <laughs> action figures, like human action figures? Yeah, they all look exactly like human action figures. That's the perfect way to put it. So they came up with the show American Gladiators where you had these human action figures going up against uh, essentially normal people. So just just like you would have it on a game show, you know, you have your contestants. So you have these contestants, they'd go up against the gladiators. It was the same gladiators in every episode. It was like it was at the beginning, it was three men and three women. So, you know, the female contestants would have female gladiators to go against and the male contestants would have male gladiators to go against and they would compete across different kind of wacky challenges. So. For instance, one of the games was called Human Cannonball, and the contestant would be like 20 feet in the air on this platform, and they would swing on a rope like Tarzan and try, and a, a gladiator would be on a pedestal like 10 feet in the air or whatever, simply holding like a little pad, like a square pad as a shield, essentially. And the uh, the old human cannonball. I mean, it, it it is what it sounds like. It really should have been, I guess, human wrecking ball. But the the contestant <laughs> that would have been better. The yeah. contestant would swing on the rope and crash into the gladiator in the hopes of knocking the gladiator off the pedestal, you know, on safely onto a mat below. And then conversely, the gladiator was trying to not get knocked off the pedestal. And if you knocked the gladiator off, you got a point. If you didn't, you got zero points. And uh, essentially, at the end, one of the contestants was the winner of the show. Whoever had the most points at the end, that was the winner of, of the, the episode. And that was it. You know, there were other um, contests where you would, it was essentially like a, a football game where you would have a ball and you would try to score a touchdown and the gladiator would try to keep you out of the end zone. That was another one of the games. Yeah. They had the, the kind of an obstacle course thing where they had to hit the target. That's the one that was that I really liked because it had the, the shoulder bazooka, mm -hmm. you know, to hit the thing. And then the last ditch, just like little balls that they could throw when they were close up. Like that was amazing to watch. That was, that was every, I think that was everyone's favorite. Cause that was definitely my favorite. And as we were watching it, my wife said it was her favorite as well. So I think that was like the resounding favorite of, it was essentially like if, if you're familiar with a human dunk tank, at a carnival where you have to throw a mm. ball at a target and it knocks a person into 
a pool. It was like a version of that where you had to hit a target with like various sort of nerf guns while a gladiator was trying to shoot you with a tennis ball chain gun. <laughs> <laughs> it was sweet. It was definitely sweet. You know, all of these things, too, were like the games that you wish you could play with all of your friends. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, it was like taking gym class games uh, on the craziest steroid science could provide. And it was just every single task that they did was was straight up fun. Oh, the, oh, the pugil sticks too. Uh, joust. Yeah. Joust. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're on a balance beam with a couple giant Q-tips and just smacking the hell out of out of somebody and trying not to fall like that. That that is never not going to be good TV. So so it was gym class on steroids competing against people literally on steroids. Yeah, on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's the premise of the show. Um, yeah. I will say it's like, oh, here, here's Bob. He's an accountant who likes jogging on the weekends. Let's see how he holds up against a, a, a man whose thighs are like 93 inches in circumference. <laughs> What's interesting is that that was season two. Uh, in season one, it was kind of like steroid guys versus steroid guys and steroid girls versus steroid girls. Okay. In season two, they brought in like a whole new person to figure out how to make the show better. And that was one of the elements of making the show better was like, the contestants need to be more under like underdogs. They need to be more like weekend warriors who, yeah, they are accountants by day, but you know, secret super athletes by night. Mm -hmm. Uh, and any, I also want to say before we get into what this has at all to do with AI is that another piece of this, I think is super interesting is that this show was torn apart for being like the most scrapingest, bottomest of the barrel -est, dumb idiot show that ever existed. Everyone sort of hated the show and pointed at it as like the <laughs> sort of end of culture in the United States, the end game of intelligence in the United States. Mm -hmm. It was American Gladiators was the poster child for just dumb American culture in 1989, which is really interesting to think about in 2023. And that made it absolutely incredible when we were seven, eight, nine, ten years old. <laughs> like there is not a show that could be better when you're in like fifth grade than American Gladiators. It is not possible for entertainment to be better than American Gladiator American Gladiators was for us. It was getting better better uh better ratings than the NFL at one point. To put that to put yeah, it into context. It was real sports and athleticism mixed with with a wrestling vibe, you know, but but it it truly was real athletic competition, you know, and sometimes these people uh, it would just get, you know, blasted off the podium because they did not have the strength and, and weight and athletic skill. And it was like a mundane thing, but that was very real about it too, because you look at the guy and it's like, okay, this is somebody who's going to get blasted by the action figure man. <laughs> and other times they would pull it off somehow. And it was, it was amazing when they did, you know, it, whether they were, they were, uh, out competing on one of the you know, more skill based things, or they just got a lucky shot in that obstacle thing and happened to hit the bullseye. It, it's like it, you get this massive celebration for the, the loser underdog who has no business coming out on top. So it was this really excellent blend of those people uh, making it and, and really, really competing properly. And also the expected you know, no surprises. Here's the great athlete just tooling on the normal guy. So it, it was, they stumbled into something that, that had both outcomes. And if it's one or the other, you know, it's not going to be a, a great show. You know, it has to have uh, that whole continuum. So it did run for a, a, a long time, a couple of years longer than, than I remembered. If you say it went to 96 or so. Um, but a lot of shows now are, refined versions of, of where that started. Like you truly can see the genesis of some of the athletic competitions now originating, uh, originating in that show. Absolutely. So what, what was interesting to me and, and now I'll bring it into the sort of the AI thing 
is that uh, I, I, I have had this inkling surrounding this argument or this debate or this conversation about AI replacing creative folks. How does how do you pull something about AI out of AG? <laughs> uh, by the way, they said they they spun off American Gladiators to the UK and it was ten times more popular over there. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. Which no which I they 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 threw in as like a footnote in this five hour or whatever four hour documentary, and now I'm like, man, I, I would watch a whole doc just on like the British Gladiators because that sounds really interesting to me. What it would have been intriguing because I, I can't imagine they would have bothered using mouth guards because like, what are you going to ruin? <laughs> and, and one of them had to be well, named big Ben. Risk? I mean, come on. One of the gladiators had to be named or like bigger Ben. <laughs> bigger ben. Uh, <laughs> huge Ben. Um, I, I, I've had this feeling that I haven't been able to. Okay. So, when you're talking about conceptual things, it's really important. I, I have noticed sort of over the years, especially doing this podcast, is when you have a concept, if you don't have like a concrete analogy to make, it is super hard to get people on board with you and know and sort of understand what you're talking about. So I haven't even bothered to really try to talk about my feelings about the, RA, uh, the uh, AI thing because I hadn't, didn't have anything to point to. Well, I feel as though I stumbled upon something to point to with this American Gladiators doc. So let me start with the concept. Okay. The concept is that ultimately the reason that AI cannot wipe out, and I'm just saying wipe out, I'm not saying that it can't replace pockets of creative work because it can and it will and it already is. That's happening and it, and it will continue to happen and, and that sort of thing will expand. But it cannot wipe out creative endeavor because of the human element. Because people ultimately connect with other people when it comes to creativity. It's not this in a vacuum content thing. Okay. Now, this is why I, I haven't talked about this because it's, it's getting into conceptualization. And it's like, okay, what are you talking? What does that mean? What are you talking about? It this sounds hard to articulate what you've said so far, you, you know, like I, I'm listening to it and, uh, and waiting for the details and thinking, Oh, this is, this is going to be tough to get right. Like I see, I totally see where you're going. And I think this is hard to map out. It's hard to map out without, yeah, any sort of landmarks. So mm -hmm. <laughs> of all things, please allow me to use American gladiators in 1992 as our landmark <laughs> <laughs> landmarks on this map, okay? Because here's what happened that was so interesting. So, first of all, you have to understand that the American gladiators who were the famous gladiators, so Ice, Zap, yep. Gemini, Nitro, these were the gladiators that action figures were made of back then. Yeah. They were famous yeah. gladiators. So, it wasn't this real rotating cast of characters. Some people came in and out, but there was essentially like an... There was a core. There was an A-list Mount Rushmore tier of gladiators that everyone knew, okay? Mm -hmm. and, the, and these were the you know, these were people like Ice, Zap, Gemini, and Nitro. Well, when this f show first started, well, really throughout its duration, these gladiators... Quite frankly, and, and I, I'm not mocking them. This is part of the documentary. These people were desperate for work. They were they, uh -huh. they were desperate for work in entertainment. They were desperate to become famous and receive adoration from crowds. Like there's a reason that they became gladiators, and that's because they wanted all of the sort of what would you call it? Um like ancillary benefits that came along with it, which is being recognized, being beloved, having fans cheer for you. They want, so, so that is to say they signed contracts that were 100% not only predatory, but now illegal in the United States. They signed contracts that are literally now illegal <laughs> to sign because they were that predatory. They signed contracts yeah. that were in perpetuity in wow. perpetuity 
Well, yeah, I mean, they didn't have a whole lot to lose at that point. And it, I really want to reinforce how vulnerable the, the class of people who, who uh, I, I'm trying to think how to describe this, um, people who are in kind of a bodybuilding class, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, think of how few opportunities there are for those people to have jobs that are relevant to what they've done with their bodies. I mean, actual decent jobs. And this was a thing through the 80s, 90s, like only very, very, very recently where you could be like an Instagram fitness person. Was there a viable way to pay your rent from getting in great shape? And this was really bad in the 80s and the 90s. I've mentioned a movie that I forget if it won seven or eight Oscars. It's called Over the Top with Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's, if you're, you're familiar with this movie, um, there's a, a character in it named Carl Adams. He's a Canadian arm wrestler. He makes it to the final. Well, the guy who played Carl Adams is actually in, uh, I think it's Bigger, Faster, Stronger, the documentary about about steroid use, which I think is on on Netflix. That came out in 2015, 2016. He is mentioned in there because he goes to one of the, the gyms that is featured and he's living in a van in the parking lot. He he was he had an opportunity to be an arm wrestler in an arm wrestling movie. And, you know, when you look at it, people like this on IMDb, you see these bit parts where they're like they're like uh, thug number two. Yeah. Henchman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> henchman. Yeah. That, that's really it. You can be a henchman or like a low grade bad guy. Uh, and you get a little bit of money for that, but it's not sustainable. No. So you can be a personal trainer, which many, many, many people do. And that is almost the extent of it. There is certainly nothing of substance in entertainment for 99.99% of people who, who get their bodies in this shape. That is, it, that's the same way now. You know, and if you think about it, there are just really limited uh, applications for any of this you know and if you take away that social media thing where it's it's being like a fitness influencer what else is left nothing there's no there's nothing and there was even less of nothing in 1989 you know and when you when you go and watch things like documentaries that are about sports uh or, or fitness people um you really get a sense of how much goes into it and how the payoff is Nothing, <laughs> nothing. If you watch, no, if you watch the Arnold Schwarzenegger documentary, it is a long time. Like it's very subtle. They don't point this out, but he'll say things like, you know, I went to this competition and, you know, made a friend. They were impressed with what I was doing. And then the next thing he sa- he says is like, yeah, well, you know, they flew me to London for this one. And I, you know, I stayed with them for a few weeks. Think about what that means. He could not buy the plane ticket himself to go to London, and he could not put himself up in a hotel room. He simply did not have income or means coming from these endeavors. And he was, he was very good at that point. He was dominant in Europe. He wasn't, uh, dominant worldwide at that point. That's part of the story of him getting there. But all of these guys, and it's like that in pumping iron too, they're maybe getting little sponsorships and they have to do appearances and uh, they scrape by. You know, and it's like that for Olympians now, too, where, believe it or not, uh, if you want to do luge, you have limited opportunities to to, you know, pull like sustainable income in as you're doing. Um, (laughs) Right. You know, some sports are better than others with this, but it's like, (laughs) Like all right, if I'm going to Amazon delivery, (laughs) right, delivering Amazon UPS luge luge service. Yeah. And just think about it. It's like if if somebody needs to train full-time for anything, which truly is full-time, um, how do they make a living? How do they make a living on top of that? It is really not easy. When I was taking bowling seriously and I was going to um, I was going to go on tour for a year, the first thing that I did was writing. It was <laughs> how can I make money through writing so that I can go and lose money? on this other thing I want to do Mm -hmm. because I knew there was absolutely no hope, no hope at all of even breaking even on that endeavor. So it's like, what's compatible with this experience 
that will pay enough of the bills to allow me to do it. And I knew that I was going to lose money and that I was going to come out at best where I started, just having had the experience. So that's a me being able to rely on completely separate set of skills, which I happen to have with the ability to apply it online at that time, which was a new thing. What would I have done in 1985? Like, <laughs> no, no. And with bowling, you would meet these guys and hear, uh, hear their stories where it's like they would save up, you know, they would just work their jobs and save up for a long time enough so that they could do one go at the tour, you know, to do the travel and the hotels and they would share rooms, you know, get roommates and stuff to cut expenses. But that was it because there was no other option. Anyway, so this was a long rant, but I think it's extremely important to contextualize the position that all of these people were in uh, going into into this show. Yeah, which is called uh, desperation. <laughs> like, you yeah, know, opportunity really was is. not knocking on any of their doors. And then all of a sudden they have someone come along and say, hey, do you want to be on a TV show? And you're going to be, you know, essentially featured as this Adonis, Hulk, amazing, strong, hyper athletic freak that contestants are going to try to best. And they all said, yes, that sounds like my dream job. And they even say this. They're like, this is my dream job. It is like the most amazing thing that could have ever happened to me. So along with their eagerness, they signed these contracts that they could never renegotiate. And they were getting paid garbage. And meanwhile, the show becomes an absolute smash hit success. They're, they're merchandising it. They're making action figures of these people, of which the, the people are getting zero dollars. They're getting no cut. Oh. They're getting no cut of someone else selling an action figure of them. They get zero dollars. Imagine going into a, a Walmart and seeing an action figure of you. And knowing that you're making nothing off of it. Nothing. But, but paradoxically. Even Uno would like it. Pia, par he, he, for five minutes, he'd be like, oh, I finally get my dream of my action figure. That's it. And then like the next day, the next day he'd be like, oh, I kind of wish I were getting a buck. <laughs> yeah. They're, uh, they're blown away and really excited that they, they are an action figure. And yes, a few weeks later they say, Hey, can I get like a penny? For every one of these that is sold, that would be useful to me. So anyway, that's what happened is that the, the show got more and more popular. These people were becoming celebrities and superstars, and they were not being compensated for the growth at all, literally at all. So they banded together, the top four of them, the ones that I mentioned, Ice, Zap, Gemini, and Nitro. They tried to get a few of the other ones to come in with them, and they didn't. They, they wouldn't hmm. because they didn't want to risk losing their jobs because even though it paid like crap and they could get injured at any moment and have their career and life ruined, they didn't want to risk upsetting management and getting fired over asking for a pay raise. It's the union question, isn't it? Yeah. They, they just... they. Didn't want to risk joining the, <laughs> the Gladiators Union. Yeah, the, the Gladiators Union. Yeah, the revolution. I don't know what you've been sipping, but you've got it all wrong. It's time to commit to the leaf. We've embraced the smoothness and surprising pick-me-up that tea provides. I literally drink it all day long, nearly a gallon a day, and it powers me through research, script writing, and forums on websites that I refuse to name here. But we don't drink normie NPC tea. We drink cultured and refined anime tea from the Dragon's Treasure. Kevin still likes the gunpowder green called Space Cowboy, and I've sampled nearly 40 Dragon's Treasure teas at this point. Lately, I've been slamming black teas like Kentucky Bourbon and Liquefied Berserk Despair. Scottish Breakfast is deep and peaty, and I smooth it over with Sebastian's Morning Earl Grey, which has the best vanilla cream taste I think I've ever had in a cup. Give me a pot of that with a hot meatball sub from Sal's Pizza and Brooks Barbecue Chicken to wash down my last meal on death row. I highly recommend the sampler packs. You'll want to try everything just like I did. I literally have not had one tea that I wouldn't be happy to reorder. The Dragon's Wings membership fuels new tea experimentation and the Tea of the Month Club provides a regularly scheduled surprise. And when you order from the Dragon's Treasure using code CREATE, You'll get 10% off your order. That's 10% off 
using the code CREATE at thedragonstreasure.com. The link's in the description. So, uh, long story short, the Gladiators Union was uh, essentially told, uh, okay, bye, and they were all fired. So the, the, the ones that banded together and demanded to be paid more were instead fired. They said, nope, Replaced we don't them. renegotiate contracts ever. We don't need you. Bye-bye. Because mm. foolishly, and uh, you know, we are slowly creeping towards the point here. Thank you for bearing with me. Foolishly, the creators of the show, the owners of the show, the owner of the production company, whatever, they all thought, the gladiators weren't important, okay? What's important is the show. And we can just replace them with new gladiators. Like, we don't need Nitro, Ice, and Zap, and Gemini. We can just swap them out, you know, with Titan and Muscles and uh, Viper <laughs> and Chains. And <laughs> no one will care. No one will care. Uh, I think one of the... Well, I'll get to this later, but remind me to make a sports analogy here because they, uh, so, so I'll bring, I'll bring it, I'll bring back the sports thing later. Uh, long story short on this end, what happened was ratings tanked, mm -hmm. ratings tanked when they got rid of all of the really popular, famous gladiators on the show, American gladiators. Okay. And within a few years. Not only were they begging some of them to come back, which a couple of them did to mixed results, but at that point it was too late. The show was canceled and took a nosedive and no one cared and it was dead. It did not take long for the show to just crumble into dust after that decision was made. Can, can I ask if they, if they said anything about the rationale there? Because it seems really obvious because of like at that time too, when you think about the WWF through the eighties, that was built on, on characters that, that were people that were, uh, you know, recognizable and always there, you know, and by 1989, you could list off six or seven, even if you didn't watch wrestling. And I didn't, I, I have never watched wrestling, but I still knew like 10 wrestlers from the eighties. Mm -hmm. And it seems so obvious that you need those personalities around uh, because that that's what people like. Imagine if WWF was like a new crop of wrestlers every single week. Nobody would have cared. There's nothing to care about, right? You can't care about anybody if they're only there once. That that So uh, a couple of things that actually um, allies directly into the sports thing. So. Okay. They were thinking of it like a basketball team where you have the Boston Celtics and there are new mm. players all the time. So what does it matter? What's important is basketball and what's important is the brand of the Boston Celtics because people are a fan of the brand of the Boston Celtics and players come and go. And that's what the American <sighs> Gladiators um, is. It's a brand. There's a team. The team is the American Gladiators, and we can plug and play different Gladiators in, and it's not going to make a difference. Yeah, that is just so wrongheaded. <laughs> it's even wrongheaded on sports. I know. You know how many that's times what, that was Kevin, what I wanted to say exactly. Yeah, how many times have has one of us said just out of nowhere, like this this team, like we were talking about the White Sox a few weeks ago, winning the World Series. Like, is this the most forgettable baseball team of all time? And we were struggling to name anybody on the team. I got one guy. <laughs> yeah. And and I'm and I watch I watched a lot of baseball then, uh, to the point where uh, I watched. Let me see. The, the year before that, I watched over 150 Red Sox games. That is, I I missed a handful of them. So you know, I pretty committed baseball fan, and I could name one guy on a World Series winning team. And if. It, <sighs> I wouldn't have been able to tell you the year that the White Sox won either because it has been long enough. That That's just not true. You know, what you described is not the way anything works. No, no, it's it's not. And that was exactly what I thought. I was like, dude, it's so obvious even in sports that people connect to players because look at the Chicago Bulls. 
Like, do you think that the Chicago Bulls received more attention and adulation when it was Michael Jordan on the team or when it was like Taj Gibson and <laughs> Joakim Noah? You know what I mean? Like the people matter. Yeah. You know, the, the Bulls are funny, too, because you had these two distinct Jordan eras, you know, the before and after that initial retirement. And that was the case where you had a core on both of those eras that was consistent. And then like this year would come up and it's like, here's a guy named Luke Longley who you've never heard of before now. And he happens to be on the floor with the core who you do know and who you expect to see every time. So you would have a couple, you know, what I would call replacement players, people who add value, but are, but are not so critical to the system that they're Michael Jordan or Scottie Pippen. Um, but that's the thing. There's a difference between those two classes of guys. Yeah. Right. And it's like that in every sport, even something like uh, women's soccer. Like I, I can tell you the name Megan Rapino because she's not a replacement player on that team. I'm sure there's some people who, you know, could be dropped on the roster tomorrow and it wouldn't make a difference to the, the outcome of that team, but there are probably uh, four or five uh, of the starters who, who make up a core, right? And I'm using that example because that's not a sport I watch. And I still know <laughs> that there's a core <laughs> to, to this team and I can tell you the names of a couple of the players. That's how important it is. So what a strange conclusion to come to that they would they would just misinterpret. You know, it it sounds like the executives w were so divorced from sports fandom. It's like, let's let's have a sports show, but let's make sure everybody running it was like an asthmatic who had to sit out in gym class their entire lives. And the one time they got to play, they were picked last. Let's make sure that's who's making the decisions here. Well, when you watch the documentary, you will see that that is who was making the decisions here. 100 <laughs> Is it really? <laughs> yeah. And, and I will say that, that uh, certainly it is the case that people will just be a fan of say the Boston Red Sox, and they're happy to know the new players that come in and they're going to follow it. They have that loyalty to a team that exists. But first of all, it is extremely rare and you're, you're not, um, you, you can't build your entire business on just the hardcores. Like there's a reason that even in sports, okay, even in like the NBA, the Lakers are trying to get LeBron James onto the team. There's a reason for that. Because it makes the Lakers more famous and relevant to have LeBron than it does to have, uh, you know, whoever they traded him for. I don't even remember at this point, which is the point. I don't you even all, remember you, who they traded him for. You always need people to latch on to. And it's like this. D'Angelo Russell? It's like this in know. everything. Yeah. I mean, everything truly is like this. We think about something as basic as, as history, right? You needed, you need leaders to latch on to. You know, it, it's very important that you have uh, a Churchill in your time of need. Even the, even the other team in that particular conflict had some big personalities that people rallied around. <laughs> That's right. Right. Yeah. Be because this is just plain how everything works. And if you don't have that, it's very, very hard to build any kind of cohesive identity they, that it's got to be very clear what and who you are a fan of or supporting anything. You know, it's like this with YouTube stuff. This is the idea behind building channels. Like you, you have a personality that, or a style uh, that people become a fan of. You know, do you have, I mean, you could take all the topics that all three Vsauce channels have done and just, just to have a, like a new person doing that topic and put those videos on a channel. Well, think of, how hard it would be to be a, a fan of, for a, you know, I don't know if that's the right word, but like to be into that content compared with thinking, you know, Michael's super weird when he explains things and I like the way he does it. So I'm interested in him explaining the Banakatarsky paradox, you know, like otherwise it's just a collection of stuff and you can't get behind people 
or you can't get behind a thing that's a collection of stuff, whether it's the 2006 White Sox or uh, American Gladiators with replacements, like uh, or a, a blob of a, a leaderless country. You know, it just nothing, nothing works that way. No, because people oh, connect con- to people. Real quick, I have to say this because this is amazing. Conrad says, is this why weather people get paid so much? This is a really good example of what we're talking about, because here, at least, I don't I don't know what it's like in the rest of the world, because I, I've just finished with that. Uh, but like a, a local TV network would get a weatherman or weather woman, whatever, and they would ride it for like 30 years. That that person was just like the weather oracle for you within 50 miles in either direction. And it was like there's a personality connected to the weather person, you know, and, and news anchors as well, like Bill Warden on Utica TV was there for many, many, many years. Jason Paulus on sports is still there. This is how things work. Dan the Latch says, shout out to NBC 10's Bill Henley. Like <laughs> This is how we process everything. Weather is a great, great example of this. Nobody says like, uh, well, let's we'll see, see what's on the weather. It's like, no, I, I, I want to see what Bill Henley says about the weather. What, what's Bill telling me tonight? Yolanda Vega with Lottery, Boss Thread says. She got like nationally famous for announcing the New York lottery numbers with this amazing, you know, Yolanda Vega intro. And it, it, she just became an institution. Wheel of Fortune is Wheel of Fortune because it's Pat and Vanna. Alex Trebek was Jeopardy. You know, this is, this is how everything works. And it's how it will always work. Um, and and before this so. this the create the uh, episode chat scrolls too far, I want to just read what Jen wrote here. Stories don't work if people can't connect to the characters. Everything is a story. So that is yeah. that's a much better way of explaining what I was trying to explain. American Gladiators tanked because it wasn't just the content that people were tuning in for. They were tuning in to see. The gladiators that they loved compete against the people that they didn't know because the contestants are already an unknown uh, factor, an unknown quantity. You don't know who the contestants are, but you want the consistency of rooting for your favorite gladiator. And what they should have done, which is what WWE has done really well, is like not only do you ride these personalities and these characters for a really long time, the WWE has a Hall of Fame. Okay. Th- think think of how weird it is ki- in a way that the WWE has a Hall of Fame because it's not an actual athletic competition. It it really is like physical athlete storytelling. You know, it's it, mm-hmm. it's like a physical soap opera. So it's it's <laughs> yeah. not like someone is better at hitting a ball than someone else, so they should be in the Hall of Fame. What it is though is that someone is better at being beloved and moving the needle and getting a pop by the crowd over the course of 15, 20 years or whatever than someone else. So they're a Hall of Famer. Think about this in terms of American Gladiators. If they did it properly, there would be a Hall of Fame of American Gladiators. There's no reason that American Gladiators shouldn't still be on to this day and like Nitro, Zap, Ice, and Gemini shouldn't have been first ballot American Gladiator Hall of Famers. That's the direction that they should have went. And instead, they went in the total opposite direction, which is that you guys are replaceable nothings. You are zilches. And what people actually want to watch is just this show of muscly people competing against citizens off the street. And the, the answer to that was a resounding no, because the people tuned out. They didn't care anymore. They didn't know who these new gladiators were. It wasn't, you know, interesting anymore because they, they, they cut out the pathos, the human connection mm. element of the show. And that's why it brings you in, brings me into AI is like, yes, could the AI write a great book? Maybe. Are you, is anyone going to care? If there's no person to connect the writing to, or or, or are they going to care about reading the book of someone who they like? Yeah, there's, this is so hard to articulate what the, 
what the difference is because uh, I think a lot of the the AI stuff is adequate for for most people. You know, it is totally serviceable. Um, and the question is, how much do you need to care? You know, if you hit a point, um, you know, well, this is. Oh, I hope I don't do this badly because it's not a genre I know. But I think of this in in what I read about horror movies on Twitter, where um, some people like horror movies because they were just like crazy gore. It was just visually fantastic to them. That was awesome. And then other people want want a real movie. You know, they they <laughs> they want the characters to be like believably scared and this and that, as opposed to uh, just like a VFX showcase. You know, so you do have a class of people who are perfectly satisfied by by that surface level stuff. You know, and they. It, when when American Gladiators tanked, it didn't go to zero. That last episode, there were still people watching. It was a much smaller number, but those people were totally, totally satisfied by the the Dollar General Gladiators <laughs> that were on the show now. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, they were happy with that. Uh, so the question to me is: To what degree does this matter, and how many people does it matter to? Uh, it's really hard to parse because I don't know the answers to it. I mean, I do, you know, there's a lot of content that, for example, creators, we would never have on the show <laughs> because they are the replacement players of entertainment, <laughs> <laughs> but they're still extremely successful. You know, I'll look at, at their videos and just be like, okay, well, this is not zero sum. This isn't, yeah, but this is my yeah. argument that it's not zero sum. But yes, like AI will have a place and it will replace some of it, <clears throat> but it cannot and never will replace all of it because at the end of the day, people want to connect with people. And it already is this way in Hollywood, which is the reason that Tom Cruise can get a movie made and Kevin Lieber can't, <laughs> okay? Because Tom Cruise is going to have the, rec you know, uh, he's going to sell tickets. People know who he is. They like him. They trust him. They want to see the new Tom Cruise movie. That doesn't mean that Tom Cruise can't make a box office flop. He has. But ultimately, when people in Hollywood are making decisions, I can assure you that it requires known quantities to attach, usually multiple, to attach to a project. Who's the director? Oh, yeah. Who, who's the lead? What's the talent? Who cares how good the script is? It doesn't matter. It just just doesn't matter. It's just dead words on a, on a slice of a dead tree. What matters are the people involved, and you're not getting anything made without certain people involved. And it worked for American Gladiators. It works with YouTube, which is you know the reason that like Moist Critical can make a video about whatever, and a million people are going to watch it. Plus, I could make the same exact video word for word that uh, and say all the words that he said. And I guarantee you a million people are not interested because <laughs> they don't care about those words coming out of my mouth. They care about those words coming out of Charlie's mouth. We want to help you make something and mean something. And we say that phrase all the time because when you're making something and you know it means something, even if it's just to you, that's when you feel pretty good about what you're creating. The support for the Create Unknown in recent weeks has been incredible. Animators, artists, musicians, YouTubers, aspiring filmmakers, comedians, it is crazy how talented everybody in this community is. Consider joining the Create Unknown Patreon. Every dollar that comes through goes straight into the podcast and its community. That means more highlights videos. It means a big Minecraft project that's on the way. And eventually we'd like to manufacture custom piss bottles so you never have to leave your battle station. And being a patron unlocks participation in all of our live recordings. You've seen the roster of guests we've had. Having access to their minds is a unique opportunity. You can go to patreon.com slash thecreateunknown or click the link that's in the description. Every little bit helps and your support means absolutely everything to us. Patreon.com slash thecreateunknown. Links in the description. We appreciate you, Space Cowboys. Mm -hmm. There's a difference there. There's a big, big difference. Um, you know, and I, I am concerned that too few people will have an interest in the personal connections and the nuance that, that we're talking about. Um, 
and and I one spot where I think about this is how popular uh, like first person shooting games are. Things like Call of Duty, right? And I, like I think about Call of Duty because they so uh, they tie them to specific <clears throat> time zones or time zones, timelines, and and events so frequently. Uh, if you take if you take the guns that you're shooting in a World War II game. It is a very different experience to actually shoot those guns in real life because they kick like I, I, I all the words that came to mind right now, I can't put in this podcast. <laughs> That's why I'm stumbling here. Uh, but like there's one uh, there's uh, uh, the Russian Mosin, depending on how it's what, what load you put into it. Unless you're a real big guy, it's sort of like uh sort of like somebody taking a hammer and hitting your shoulder, swinging it at your shoulder. Yeah, Jen says, OMG, the Mosin is bleeping brutal. It is. It's just like, think about what Russians are like in history and then think, oh, what kind of gun would a Russian design? One that has no regard at all for the person shooting it. <laughs> if it <laughs> if it turns them into like mashed cauliflower, who cares as long as, you know, Stalin gets his shot out? Um, but, you know, this is a long way of saying what if you had a game that replicated that, if you if you uh, could pop on a VR headset and you're standing uh, in, a, in a machine that actually did to your body what the guns in the game you're playing should do, almost nobody would want to play that game. They, they don't want that realism because it's 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 terrible. It, it's hard. It's just it's not it's not fun right for almost everybody you've got to really want to know that experience to feel that experience uh it's a unique desire that that almost nobody has and that's a really specific example to me of well if you made it the best you could if it was the best pop possible experience the thinnest subset of people would actually want to do it you know they want the sanitized low level fun version uh that is call of duty right they can pause you know that's <laughs> that's a big deal pauses don't happen in real life imagine you've got this suit on that obliterates your shoulder every time you pull the trigger and the you know your, your dominoes arrives the doorbell goes and you can't get out of the suit because the game doesn't let you pause you know, you, you just sit there uh, like absorbing bullet wounds and then, and, uh, you know, it simulates your death by just locking you in the suit for like two hours. <laughs> like, this would be very realistic. Uh, nobody's playing that game. So do they do they want the do they want the real story? That's my question to bring it to, to what you're talking about, where it's like you got to have these personalities. You got to have the stories. Everything is a story. But how real do they want that story to be? I, I don't even know if that's, I mean, that seems like a different question. My, my point here is that people connect to people. Here's a better example I thought of while you were um, discussing blowing your shoulder off <laughs> with, uh, with Russian firearms. Uh, paintings. The most extreme example of this concept has to do with the art world because people will pay millions and millions of dollars for the most ridiculous fart on a piece of canvas if it was farted by Picasso. That yeah. same exact thing has no real intrinsic artistic objective value aside from the person who made it. Okay? Yeah. None. I have I have pieces like that that are not good. They are not good at all and they only have value of any kind because of their association with someone who did good things elsewhere. <laughs> but the actual thing that I own sucks. Sucks. <laughs> sucks. It's not, it's not good. Yeah. There are so many paintings, especially in modern art, that suck. They're so stupid. And they will sell for millions of dollars because this particular person made this stupid piece of crap. It's the people that other people connect to that makes it interesting, that provides that extra layer of value so that... Other people can brag also that they own a Picasso, you know, so that there's like a social signaling element to it. Because actually to go to your point about like people not caring, 
that works the other way too. So like if you have this uh, piece of, uh, man, I'm trying to think of an example that would make any <laughs> sense, a violin that was made by Stradivarius, mm -hmm. okay? If the violin itself had all of these construction elements that made it the greatest violin in the world, who in the world are, is going to care except for like hyper, uh, like aficionado violin construction people? Nobody cares. No one yeah. cares that the this construction or this blend of woods combine to make the violin acoustically resonate at a certain <laughs> <laughs> whatever um, they don't care it's a hyper niche they don't care okay what they do care about though is that they've heard the name stradivarius it's the most famous name in probably all of musical in in it's, instruments it's got a, yeah it's certainly uh, the biggest yeah it's like the the babe ruth of of music and that's what they would talk about and that's why it would be valuable and that's why people would care because people care about people and that cannot go away ai cannot you know, eliminate that you know, so there's an example of this where I didn't care. That's hyper current and relevant. I, I'm, I'm gonna. I, I have an example that speaks to the kids. Uh, so I've been watching Secret Invasion, the Marvel show on Disney Plus. Um, so there was this for you know one afternoon on Twitter. It was a really big deal that uh, they used AI to make the opening sequence. And artists were spazzing out on Twitter about how they were boycotting, you know, the, like stealing artists' jobs by doing this. That intro is completely fine. It is totally fine. It, it's like, it's a show intro with some credits, you know, and it's like artistically nice. It's, it's okay. Like, uh, it isn't super epic, but I can't name too many show intros that are. Uh, but it's a 100% uh acceptable replacement i lose nothing by that being ai generated it's good it does the job you know that's a, a, a slice of the show it's just the opening sequence so it's not like the whole show is ai but that's an example where i don't care i don't care and i'm not going to watch uh uh i'm not going to watch a show and be like ooh, I, I hope this one was done with human hands like no it's it's good or it isn't it does job or it doesn't uh for something like that and that's one where ai it's like i wouldn't have known and I, I didn't know until i saw it on twitter and i watched the show before i saw those tweets it never even occurred to me that that artists didn't sit down and do that it was perfectly acceptable and i didn't care and even after they complained i still didn't care you know i, I also don't have any sympathy for for that like we're stealing our or jobs and artistry angle, you know, because that's just tech to me. That's just the way technology moves. And sometimes a skill goes by the wayside, you know. Uh, nobody is saying like, oh, Adobe just ruined uh, that whole process of, of like taking celluloid tape to, to, you know, cut film together. Like, no, come on, that's dumb. That's dumb, but that's what it did. You don't have to do that anymore because software does it really, really well. So what's the difference? But, you know, that that segment was a thing where I'm like, all right, AI did this and I don't care. And I will not value, I will not value um, the same outcome done by human hands. If there's something that's amazing, if for some reason that title sequence, the credits was like the highlight, you know, and this happens with some shows where like the, the jingle is is part of the experience, you know, friends in part got really famous because that opening song and uh, the the intro was like you know an institution of its own sopranos cheers um, yeah yeah exactly uh so that can happen but you know most of the time it doesn't you know if if a human is making something better then it's just going to be better that's fine and if they're not then why would i care about about ai doing just as good a job well i think the the difference there is that there there is no human connection to make with you and the people making intro cards. There is no human element. Uh, There's no true. human involved. You don't know. Oh man, this is a a Max Dugutty intro. I, I love Max <laughs> Dugutty intros. He is sick at doing like title cards and like kinetic font work. 
Like that doesn't, there's, that doesn't exist. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Instead, it's just, it happens magically without you knowing. And it's either going to happen magically by people you'll never know, or it'll happen magically by code that you'll never know. Well, why, well, why can't, why can't AI repeat the same characters in the same themes? Because I think of those repetitive formulaic shows. I mentioned one in the last podcast, Father Brown, based on the G.K. Chesterton novels uh, that are so old. It, it's really formulaic. You know, every episode, there's a murder in a small town and, you know, you get a red herring or two and eventually you find out who did the thing and why they did it. Father Brown and his team figure it out. Uh, I like that show because I like those same characters. You know, each of the, the few people in that church community they have their own quirks and their own contributions to, you know, getting to the, the truth on these things. I don't see why AI couldn't pump out 10,000 Father Brown episodes that would come out to me the same way the current ones do with those same characters kind of behaving the same way. They can. Um, That's not my argument. Just the way an okay. AI could come up with like 14 new American Gladiator events. Who cares? Mm. AI could come up with 10 new Gladiator events every season. I don't care who came up with the events. But I want to see Ice, Zap, Gemini, and Nitro compete in them. I have to have yeah. some sort of human connection at some level. That's my point. When it comes to generating a lot of the stuff that I don't know who generates it anyway or care, True. What then what is the difference? There is none. Now, certainly- It's actually all, all Max Dugoody. It's all he, Max he, Dugoody. <laughs> he, he's in a basement uh, and they never let him out. He's, he's, his skin is like golems yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he just generates all the entertainment in the world. <laughs> but, but, there, but on some level, on some level, there will be a connection to a creator like Wes Anderson or like Quentin Tarantino, um, uh, like Martin Scorsese in which people go to see that person's new thing. That's its own thing too. And, and that won't change because there's no difference between that really and like a famous YouTuber, like people are connecting to the creator. Now, if Martin Scorsese's next script was AI generated, but he's still directing it, then do you care? Does anybody care? I don't know. I don't really even know who wrote most of his yeah. films. I have no idea who wrote the screenplays no. for Scorsese's films. I have no clue. I don't know. I don't know what people are going to care about and how hard they're going to care about it. That's, that's the, that's the difficult part with all of this to me is that part of me says no one's going to care because they're quite happy with surface level mundane things that, um, you know, if it entertains them in the moment, that's it. And they just, they just keep rolling. Um, but there's a subset of people who are really going to care. People like us are going to care. Right. And we acknowledge that, we're not in the majority with how we we uh, watch and process anything. I see this as a tremendous opportunity where where you look at this situation and think, what's something that I can do that is just uniquely human? And that changes from medium to medium. But oh, the people who jump on that, they've got something to sell. You know, they have they have an identity in what they do just by pushing a button that the content mills, whether they are people pumping out boring content, and there's a lot of them, or uh, uh, an algorithm making the content. If you can push a button that none of those things can push, then you can at least say or show, I'm doing something that you can't get elsewhere. That is such a tremendous opportunity to me. You know, The hard part is obviously finding the thing. Uh, that's different, and then uh, hoping that somebody values that thing. But at least you've got something to hold on to. You've got something specific that you can point to and try to get people to buy into. Okay, so I just figured out why the American Gladiators example was so amazing to me, because a lot of these other examples that I've brought up throughout this podcast, you're right, have been sort of like auteurs, and it's the type of thing that like kind of only nerds care about, you know, like 
but only and, and there can be a lot of nerds like there are a lot of nerds who love wes anderson films he's very very famous and very very popular he is not <laughs> making uh a billion dollar movie ever that will never happen like he doesn't have the critical mass like even though he's very popular he is still like a nerd auteur filmmaker that nerd auteur fans like <laughs> and follow yep. okay it's a niche all right so that's what i liked about the american gladiator example because that is not a nerd auteur show that was like the most white bread middle america popular popcorn average joe show that existed for a slice of time that absolutely tanked when they didn't follow what i'm talking about when they ignored what i'm talking about they said it doesn't matter it's just the content that matters and that's wrong it's wrong to say only the content matters because people don't only value content on the face value of the content they also value the people connected to the content in a lot of ways more more so yeah. than the content they like the people more than they like the content so that is why i think that this is part of a discussion that yeah is hard to get through but uh i think is important to try to because while i hear a lot of people talking about how ai will replace all of this this whole time i've been like it will replace a lot of things but not all of it because it can't because there will always be people that other people have to connect with that can't be replaced by an ai no it was really funny when you this morning when you said you you wanted to talk about this documentary it's it's the number one suggestion to me on netflix but i haven't watched it yet and the very first thing i said to you was i hope I hope that they, they, that Nitro is in it a lot. Cause he was awesome. <laughs> and, and you told me, you're like, yeah, he's, he's like a main feature in this thing. Now that is 30 years later, over 30 years later from something that I was watching in like third grade. And my initial instant thought is I hope the cool guy is in it. That, that it just was right there instantly for me. And that's this connection that, that Kevin's talking about where you think about people like that. You know, we started to talk about the show. I'm like, oh yeah, I like the pugil sticks and I like this and that. And that. But no, no, no. The very first thing that, that your mind buys into is somebody and their story. Nitro, I liked his name. I liked uh, his persona. Um, <clears throat> you know, some of the other names just, uh, I don't know. I Zap, I thought sucked as a name. Gemini was like, eh. I don't know, but like Nitro is a badass name <laughs> for somebody on American Gladiators. And that resonated to the point where that is what is etched in to my mind 32 years later, 34, whatever. That's, that, that's the power of this. You know, the people have a deep, deep sticking point in a way that uh, I'm sure I've seen movies that I really enjoyed watching in the moment and have completely and totally forgotten about TV shows that I watched religiously every week that I couldn't name. They, they've just dropped off the mental map over time because they didn't matter. Well, when you get people and stories in there really, really well, they don't go away. They don't go away. And if there was some kind of reboot of American Gladiators right now and I, I see the trailer for it and like Nitro is hosting because he's, I don't know how old he is now, but he's probably not. No, they, they brought him age. back for that. That's hysterical that you said that. Oh, for the reboot? No, uh, before the show was canceled the first time, they begged him to come back because they were like, oops, people don't, people actually, it actually mattered to have these people. And they begged him to come back and he was a gladiator for one. He said he would come back for one year as a gladiator only if the next year he could be um, a talking head and a host. And that's what, oh. that's what they did. So for the final season, Nitro was huh. a host. Yeah. This is crazy. Yeah. Like, like I am the, the, like the fool in this where all the stuff that Kevin is talking about is what's playing out in, in, in my normie head. 
<laughs> like right down to the specific <laughs> roles and moves that they did. And I'm saying that's the sort of thing that would resonate with me, you know, but that's the, the power of the personal connections and the stories uh, in all of this. It just is. And I, I, I don't see, I don't see how that gets replicated, you know, and I, I, I think it's possible that we we do get a bunch of things that are that immediate one-off entertainment. And I don't know how people are going to feel when there's 10 years of, of that, 10 years of stuff that you don't really connect to and that you can't remember and you're just kind of waiting for the next thing. Whereas Kevin and I have, you know, 35 years of specific people-related memories <laughs> like that's what constructs your life and your mind and who you are is all of this stuff. When we talk about sports, you know, it'll be about like Ken Griffey Jr., who uh, is not at all current with baseball, but he had that presence in that role. If you're a fan of, of certain teams like I am with the Red Sox, you know, I can name most of the 2004 roster because all those guys on the team had a role to play. And that was part of the experience of watching the season. It's like the stupidity of Kevin Millar, which I say in a, a loving way, but like you needed an idiot. <laughs> you needed a guy who's just like, let's play some baseball and, and, you know, like have a, have a, a fun time. It doesn't matter. Uh, I, I can't do that with other things, you know, but th those are what add up and stick out. It's kind of like putting a book on a shelf and you just put all these books on the shelf and as as things go along you look at it and you're like well this is my library like these are all the things that are there if you don't have those elements you're looking at like empty shelves and thinking like okay i when's the next book coming out that i'm going to read and enjoy and then not put on my shelf it's going to be really weird when i don't know like a 16 year old now goes through 15 years of uh, uh, these experiences that don't really etch themselves in into their minds anywhere. I don't know who you are if you're like 30 and there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really hard. And the closest thing I can think of with that is, um, is people who went to prison at a very young age, like 18, 19, for a long sentence. And they come out without a huge array of uh, life memories, really. They have this extremely specific niche where everything was going day to day. And like, that's, that's part of it. But they were deprived of the sorts of things that, you know, you would put on that mental shelf. Well, that's a different scenario because they couldn't do it, right? As opposed to, you know, just having content not lend itself to that kind of thing now. But I think the outcome is the same. Where if you look at your shelf and it's empty, life sucks. Life is very hard. It's very hard and there's constant immediate pressure to do something fulfilling. You know, it, it, you're waiting for the next thing to be good to watch. Uh, that's brutal. It's extremely hard. Yeah. I'm glad that you, that, that you, when I mentioned the documentary, you said, does it, you know, basically, does it have nitro? Cause yeah, you would never, that's such a perfect example of this. Cause you would never say, does it have the joust? Did they talk about the rock no, climbing wall? Like who would ever, no one can, you would never ever say that when someone brings up American gladiators, you know, sure there was, we talked about the events, but the first thing you would do is, is nine times out of 10, the person would think of their favorite gladiator and yeah, they didn't think that mattered to me. <laughs> they didn't think it That's mattered. So strange. <laughs> How crazy because it is that? Seems like, like the easy mode default. That, that you would snap to and it would be, it seems like it would be incredibly hard work to not do that. That seems easy served to you on a platter, obvious solution and, and doing anything else, literally anything else would be significantly more difficult <laughs> than doing the, the people based way. They just thought they were disposable and replaceable. They're just, we'll just get some other lunkhead in here and we'll name them, uh, you know, Apollo and it'll have the same impact. And it did not. It did not. Because people matter. People connect to other people. And that's why, if you are a creator, that's really something that you should be thinking about. You know, you shouldn't be overly concerned and 
you know, doomer about the AI stuff is there will always, always be room for people to connect with you because they have to. They literally have to. People have to do that. You know, uh, no matter where you are, no matter what type of person you have, uh, personality you have or temperament that you have. I mean, even old Ted K had to connect with people by mailing them explosives. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> even if you're yeah. him and you live in a shack in Montana by yourself, you're still doing something involved with other people. That'll always be the yeah, case. It is- it is significant that he just didn't live in his shack and and do his own thing until he died. Like it was important to him uh, to engage with the broader world. You know, he he chose a suboptimal path. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't occur to people to just kind of be like hermits of any sort, whether it's physical or mental. Like people don't really tend to work that way. Even if you do think of of hermits like monks. They're communicating with uh, a religious system, God, etc. You know, whatever the the discipline is, there they have they have something that they're living with and and living as part of. Everybody does that. You have to be really mentally. Um, I don't want to say defective. You have to be missing something neurologically that is really significant to not be connected with anything. Even if you decide that you want to avoid other people, that's its own way of gate of engaging with people. You're doing that because you do not want to see them. You're purposely living away from them. Nobody goes out in a cabin and is like, well, I'll just do whatever. I'll just do whatever. And then, you know, we'll see how long it lasts. Like, no, they engage in some way or they actively engage in the avoidance of something. So there's always some kind of engagement there. Uh, that's. That's the human element that that we're talking about with this. You know, it's a different type of it, but that's what's always there. There's got to be some kind of engagement. You know, you looked at people, you looked at the gladiators and you're like, wow, I would love to be that ripped. Well, that's the show engaging with, you know, your your fantasies of fitness. Um, nobody looked at it and was like, oh, this is just cool. If that was enough, then the show doesn't tank. Then the executives are right. <laughs> everything is replaceable and they just put out the content and everybody's happy. Well, it doesn't work that way on any level at all. Nope. Nope. So, uh, yeah, if you guys want to have, uh, a deeper understanding of what the catalyst of this conversation was, then, then consider checking out that. I mean, I'm, I'm now I'm making it sound like this episode was sponsored by this documentary. It wasn't, but it was absolutely the watershed moment for me to be able to talk about this thing that I have been ruminating on for a long time when it comes to the value of art not existing in a vacuum. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. It is connected to people and it always will be. But yeah, check it out. Muscles and Mayhem is what it's called if you're interested. And uh, oh, the other thing I wanted to say is that we got some nice comments um, on, uh, on the YouTube upload this past week. And I want to encourage more of that. You know, we do read them all. We do appreciate them all. We think, you know, for the, for the most part, they're quite thoughtful. <laughs> and uh, it's just interesting to hear what your thoughts are on these topics, because that is really the entire point of doing these podcasts is to think through this stuff. And it doesn't help entirely for Matt and I to just do it by ourselves. We want you to be involved. Uh, which is why I also want to thank the patrons in the episode chat because they're always involved. Um, this is on Discord. So if you're a Discord person and you haven't joined our Discord, please consider doing so. Uh, and if you want to support the show, go to patreon.com slash the create unknown and become a patron. All right, Nitro, Zap, Gemini, Blaze, we are out of here for now. We'll be back next week and we'll see you, Space Cowboys. Thanks for listening to The Create Unknown. We make this show with the support of our patrons. 100% of that goes directly to keeping episodes going every week, and the recent support has been amazing. Sidpoke, NRM, Venture Addicts, Weezer Good, you all really do make this show happen. Thank you to the Tots and Dumpster crew, old and new, who save tiny little lives every month. 
And thank you to our grizzled, battle-hardened child infantry. Clemente De Los Santos, Dan Malatch, Demetrius Andrews, Erica, Farrakhan, Jen Mefasanti, Kevin Menard, Mikhail Steinke, Monahim, Natsu, Penny Peddler, Rise Bread, Ryan Kinder, Samuel Manser, Sean S., Sean Malone, and Tom Videoger. And a tremendous shout out to our elite baby gang commanders. Atrocious Guff, Cat, Dojangles, Graham Robertson, James Gallagher, Jeff Davis, Orange Vanilla Coke, Patrick Pister, TCU's personal pilot, Andy, Ryan Carroll, Baseweight, Vinthos, Yetis Deletus, Jonas Walter, Nathan Robinson, Chelksies, and of course, Trevstead. You are the elite. Thank you as well to our indentured servants, producer-editor Ben Webster, Minecraft mogul Laterman, Discord kitten wrangler Conrad, and producer emeritus Dan Yoshua. Thanks to Baseweight for use of Created in the Unknown for the opening theme. Thanks to Electro Voice for giving us mics to sound good on top of it. And a special thanks to Main Gear for powering all of our PC endeavors. The Create Unknown is an unknown media production in partnership with Studio 71. 